Great. All right, with that, I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, I'm going to share screen here. Can everyone see that OK? Good. Great. Okay. So welcome to the introduction to ITSM metrics. This is a first panel in a series that we're really excited about embarking on this year. We're going to weave a number of different different metrics related topics throughout the year and those who want to come on this journey will really be leaning into um, the different types of metrics that are produced and used out of uh, service management. The purpose of these panel series um, is to present you with some case studies from different peer institutions that you can use with your own benchmarking and really sharing those case studies of where we've had successes, where we've had failures, uh, when it results to both the creation and the upkeep of, of the metrics within our organization. So um, looking forward to uh, some upcoming webinars that are going to be split out by those different um, institutions. Also, we're going to be using transcripts for authoring some actual papers um, from EDUCAUSE as we've really been uh, reaching out to experts who uh, have experience with metrics and working on some uh, technical papers that we're going to be sharing out towards the end of the year. So please ask good questions because the more we know uh, what you're interested in hearing about or having us work on, we can definitely uh, kind of curate from all of the resources out there on metrics to make it more pertinent to what you're looking for um, in relation to metrics this year. And lastly, we're uh, going to create a metrics journey map, uh, which is hopefully a little bit of a fun visual. Uh, here's our prototype, and it's a little bit like Candyland. So as you get into your own metrics um, practice at your organization, there's some common things that you might run into. Uh, things like, oh, we don't use data here to make decisions in these parts, or, oh, they show your metrics and these aren't accurate, these are all wrong. Or perhaps we don't have resources for all the effort that you're asking to put all these metrics together. So how are you going to handle uh, maybe common uh, questions or concerns that you're going to hear from your organization over this course of this year? We're going to uh, hopefully help share some input from where we've been successful in overcoming those roadblocks just to give you some um, culture ideas and strategies for how to move forward when those types of things come up. Like a metrics version of shoots and ladders. It'll be fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, we should make an actual game. That would be the, a great EDUCAUSE conference activity, right, <laughs> in a workshop. Um, all right, so just to give you an idea is uh, what we have planned for this year, uh, what you are participating in today is just the introduction to service management metrics. So we're going to give you a little bit of insight in what metrics we use, how we got started, and um, how we got, went about choosing our audiences. That's going to be today. And upcoming, we're going to have uh, in May and June a few webinars that are personal journeys from the panelists on those case studies. Um, then we're hoping July, September timeframe, we'll start working on practice and process metrics. And uh, then later this year, we'll hit on IT service metrics. And uh, then following after that, how do you roll those up into executive metrics will be um, after December. Uh, September, hopefully not December, because everybody will be checking out by then, September timeframe. So who am I? I'm Alicia Hilliard. I run the service management program at Cornell University. I like to think that I have a, um, a, a good sense of grabbing people, process, and tools and kind of blending that into a strategy where you can really move culture forward and make good decisions. I spend a lot of time looking at data and trying to drive maturity. Um, and I put a lot of effort into trying to make sure that it, that uh, everyone in the organization understands service management, hopefully at some point better than I do, because I don't manage services. They mostly do. So I put a lot of effort into um, people. I uh, do have a degree in tech management, certifications in ITIL and Six Sigma concepts, and experience with implementing uh, common service, ma service management suites 
such as ServiceNow, Remedy, and Team Dynamics. I'm very tool agnostic in that they're kind of all, you can get value out of any of these tools. There's no perfect tool. So the deeper you understand the concepts, the better you'll be able to use that tool to get the results you're really after. So I hope that's a theme uh, from everything that you see produced from Educause and from us. And with that, I'll hand it over. Andrea. Thank you. My name is Andrea Tanner. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. I'm the director of client services at Morgan State University, which is an HBCU in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, a little background about Morgan State. We have 8,500 students, about 2,000 faculty and staff. Um, the units that, I'm, that report to me include the service desk, the classroom AV team, and the computer labs. Um, I'm responsible for ITSM activities at Morgan. So in addition to what I, you know, my teams, I'm also sort of the ITSM expert. <laughs> I do um, have an IDLE 3 foundation certification and I'm certified in COVID as well. Um, just to give a little background on what tool we're using, um, since we're talking a little bit about tools, we're using um, Team Dynamics and have used it for about a year now. Um, I'm still fighting a little with reporting, but I've managed to get the basics covered out of the tools. Um, I would consider Morgan State to be kind of on the immature side of metrics gathering. We don't have fancy dashboards and tools. Uh, we're mainly using Google Sheets and Excel to capture and display our metrics, just um, so you have an idea of, of how it operates in my school. Our IT culture is still kind of in that firefighting mode, although we've made some very important strides in service improvement in management and you know, in ITSM um, principles. I'd like to say that we're, we're on that journey what we're at the beginning. Um, when I worked at Eastern Michigan, Michigan University prior, we were um, a much more mature organization when it came to planning and project management and so forth. So I bring some of that insight to my current role, which I think has been very helpful. Um, I learned at EMU how important it is to tell the story with data. Um, and I would like to pass the mic to Mark. Great, thanks, Andrea. Yeah, so I'm Mark at Source. I'm the uh, director of uh, of IT support services at Duquesne uh, Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, uh, and I have been in higher ed uh, longer than I'm uh, than I'm uh, sort of uh, wanting to admit. But uh, I was at the University of Maryland for 22 years, uh, mostly in a in an infrastructure capacity and and coding capacity. Um, but also in a leadership capacity. And I was at the University of Iowa for five years. I was at Penn State University for 10 years. I've been at Duquesne for uh, about two and a half years. But um, I mean, long story short is at Duquesne, I, I run basically all of the front facing, the sort of the front office services, if you will. And, and that includes, you know, a, a lot of things, but the most important one relative to this is, is uh, that I run the service management office. So pretty much everything related to service delivery and, and ITIL and ITSM um, falls under, under my directorate. And uh, and uh, like the others, I've got experience uh, across many of the sort of service management toolkits, you know, and, and, and platforms. So uh, Penn State was a big service now user. And again, I was at Penn State for 10 years. Uh, before that, uh, uh, lots of experience with JIRA, Remedy. Um, uh, Duquesne was a BMC shop. We just converted actually to Team Dynamics in, in early February. So Team Dynamics is kind of new to us, but we are loving what we see so far. But but again, it's not really about the tool. It's about it's about understanding how to leverage any tool to, um, as Andrea put it, to basically, or I think it was Alicia. I forget which one of you said it, but tell the story with data, and that's uh, and that's what this today is all about, right? Is how do you tell the right story to the right people with the right data, and that's uh, that's what hopefully we're, we're going to help uh, shed some light on today. So Excellent. Yep. Thanks, Mark. And that was the end of the slide. So on to the more fun part, the conversation. And thanks for those who are filling in the poll. Um, I don't know if we're going to share results just yet, but I like to see where we're shaping up out there. It looks like a lot of pockets of excellence. It's like a pair of cargo pants, lots of pockets. That's yeah, cool. and interestingly enough, I think the that have not started, do not know where to start, and the pockets of excellence, I'd probably have the same piece of feedback for all three scenarios. Um, all right, let's get started with the first question here. And one thing for everyone in the audience today, 
please take advantage of asking good questions in the chat and the Q&A um, as we're really interested in leaning into, uh, you know, giving you value out of thank you for spending an hour with us. And uh, if we know more what you're hoping to get out, we're happy to uh, answer those. So we'll an answer, we'll ask one of our pre-made questions and then we'll go um, to Bob who's monitoring the chat and see what you've given us there. The first question on the docket is what metrics do you use? Uh, what metrics do I use at, at Cornell? Uh, it's hard to give you all of them in any kind of concise way. I would say that Probably any time we're about to make a decision on my team or for the program or with the directors, it's always, well, what data can we pull on that that's going to help aid in this decision? So if we're be, we have doc days that we run four times a year, we'll pull, oh, well, how many documents need to be reviewed on doc day? We'll go pull those numbers. Um, so we'll use those types of things ad hoc. So they're raw data that we can have at our fingertips from out of the service management suite. That's more for operations and, and tactical. What do we need to do this week, this month, this year? Up from that, we do have process desktops. And there we have process KPIs and volume measurements, things for change, major incident, problem. Uh, we've got those for our process owners and those who our service delivery managers so that they can see um, metrics uh, related to process. We also have division level metrics, which we produce and um, publish out of a Tableau dashboard for senior leadership. Uh, what we try to do with all of our metrics that are within the service management program is make sure they align at all levels of the organization and that they can roll up into one another. So the higher up you kind of go on the org chart, it's the same raw volume data at the bottom, but where it's aggregated and rolling up into percentages and trends. So um, I'll be happy to share when we get lean into more what we do at Cornell to show you some examples. But we really have metrics at all level of our organization and across all of our implemented practices. Andrea, I'll hand it over to you. Sure, thank you. So the metrics I use are quite varied. Um, I utilize service desk metrics such as total tickets of the month, total remaining tickets open for the month, you know, tickets open more than 30 days, you know, number of ticket escalations to different teams, that those types of, um, uh, of information. I use those reports, you know, to help me understand the basic trends we're seeing. And I also use this, tick this information to report back to the other IT directors to let them know what tickets appear to be stale, you know, in their team queues. Um, I look at ticket reports for each of my staff, my direct reports and my teams to see if there's anything stalled out that I can help move forward. I don't do that every day, but I do that um, at least once a month to try to see if there's something that I can help. Often, if it's tickets that are not, um, you know, the delays aren't driven by the user, such as they're always, you know, working remote or something where we have to wait till they come to campus. I often find a roadblock of some kind that I can assist the technicians in moving the ticket forward. So I, I get value in, in doing that um, for more than one reason. Plus, I also know, you know, who, who may be, you know, falling short or who's doing a great job you know, that needs to be um, uh, commended for that. Uh, for several years at Morgan, we've seen an issue with account provisioning, um, new, new people, new students, new faculty, new staff. So my service desk staff was keeping a spreadsheet on which accounts were having issues. Um, and um, that was kind of falling on deaf ears until a new enterprise services director was brought on board last fall. I showed them our statistics, um, as well as the current tickets of all the students and faculty and staff whose accounts weren't ready. Um, and of course, he realized some issues were going on. And due to the level of detail that we had been tracking, he was able to troubleshoot and um, you know, figured out several issues with the new account provisioning. And, and most of those issues had been remediated. So that was um, part of the solution um, for us include, um, he was working with HR to change a little bit how they onboarded staff. That was one of the issues. Some of them were some coding issues, um, but all of this has really helped immensely. So that was something that um, I, I was just glad to see that we could bring that together quickly and he was able to react quickly. 
I also pay special attention to our closed ticket surveys. Um, our TDX tool does send out customer satisfaction surveys. In addition to the metrics, you know, how are we doing from a you know one to five stars type thing, I keep track of our um, comments and any complaints that are left in an open text box field. And if a technician is mentioned by name, I'll, I'll email them and their supervisor with the compliment. Um, I keep track of those for my own staff so that you know I put them in their annual reviews. I just copy and paste the comments that people have said, um, you know, the positive comments. Um, and reviewing those ticket surveys is a way for me to keep a pulse on how the division is doing as a whole. Helps me uncover any issues that you know otherwise might not have gotten to my level to address. So sometimes I could be proactive that way and go, oh, wait a minute, we're getting a couple comments about this. I better dig into it. I also collect printing metrics, which is kind of interesting. Before the pandemic, I kept stats for our DIT on-campus computer lab printing. This was you know, way before the pandemic. Um, in spring 2019, uh, DIT, we closed down our physical computer labs and migrated to a virtual computer lab environment. Um, and we, we also at that same time moved our printing to an outsourced printing vendor named LIPA. Uh, please know other departments such as the library and some of the schools would manage and maintain physical computer labs, but we got out of the business of that. But um, each academic building now has a WIPA kiosk to share for all the labs. And we found in our first spring semester after migrating to WIPA, our printing increased by 76%, which was kind of a shock to us. And then we realized, oh, that was because we were only keeping track of DIT computer lab stats, not all the campus. Um, in physical printers in the computer labs. So when we did work with all the departments and, and pared everything down um, to using WIPA with one, one kiosk per building, and I think our library, because of the, the traffic, has more than one kiosk. So in, in our first non-pandemic non spring of 2019, compared to COVID, for example, in 2020, we were down 48% when it came to printing. And then in spring 2021, we were down 98%, which of course that was expected. Most people were not on campus at that point. But I'm kind of interested to see how things are springing back now that a lot of classes are, are on campus. We're, we're seeing that compared with that first spring semester, we're still down about 84% in printing, which is still a huge amount, a lot more than I was suspecting. And I suspect this semester for spring 2023, which we're still in the middle of, um, I think we'll we'll be down about 70 or 75 percent compared with spring 2019. And you know the reason why I bring this up is because it was without those stats, I wouldn't even have any idea of how printing had changed. And you know we suspect that the fact that there's a reduction in printing, even though it's climbing slightly, is due to the LMS. You know the fact that during the pandemic, um, course packets were put in the LMS as well as uh, students are submitting online assignments. So I suspect that has continued um, even now when we've got most of our classes back in person. I also collect metrics on our website statistics. Uh, we are, are um, we, DIT does not manage our website, but we have a partner in our public relations department. And they send us um, reports on what websites are popular, you know, that sort of thing. So we get an idea of how people are using our website. Lately, I haven't been looking at those as much because I've been focusing more on our TDX client portal, but I hope to get back to that and kind of compare and see, well, what do we maybe need to put into our portal to make sure we have a link to, uh, because people, um, we want to push people to our portal. Um, and then just lastly, uh, just a couple of plans I have for the future. I'd like to start counting the service desk voicemail messages. Uh, we have an open position now at our service desk, and I haven't been counting them because you know that position is open, and I know we're we're understaffed. But once we get that person in and, and and staffed, I'd like to go back to looking at those voicemail messages just to get a sense of do we need to add more people on the phones at certain times of the day, certain days of the week. So as as while well, as painful it is to just because I don't have a good uh, automatic way to count these and sort this out, um, it might be something that I could have a student employee help me with. So that just gives a little introduction to um, what I'm using metrics for, and I'd wanna pass the mic to Mark. Great, thanks Andrew. So I get to go third, which is awesome because I get to be the most repetitive. <laughs> Hopefully I'll be the briefest because a lot of stuff has already been said. And I love the fact that Andrew touched on, you know, right, metrics is a lot about trending and COVID completely screwed up our worlds, right? Like just all of us, right? Like all of a sudden, all of our metrics categories have asterisks next to them and stuff because COVID just turned everything on its head. So in terms of trending, right, we're going to have to like 
we're going to have to be careful about how we assess the last couple of years in higher ed and pretty much in the world. And uh, But to Andrew's point, what, metrics are also showing us how some trends that got created by COVID have continued, right? Like people were forced to learn how to be a little more paperless and things like that, right? So those the metrics help us see that, oh, those trends kind of continue. Those lessons were kind of learned, you know, those kinds of things. That's kind of interesting. But yeah, in a nutshell, um, again, without trying to repeat a lot of the a lot of the things I heard, and it's a broad question, right? What what metrics do you use? Like who came up with this question? Oh, that's right, we did. But anyway, very broad question. But look, in, in a nutshell, uh, I, I mean, for us, and, and I without sounding presumptuous, hopefully, I think for the world. IT metrics in general fall into like four categories, right? May, maybe five, right? If, if the accountants are in the room, there, there's performance, which is, you know, uptime, right? Response time, ticket resolution, all that SLA type, right? Service level agreement, service delivery expectation, service resolution expectations, all that, all that stuff, right? About performance, right? So that's category one. And then there's capacity metrics, right? Which is, right, the idea of monitoring for growth or, or shrinkage. And, and, you know, just basically for the purpose of capacity planning, right? Like, oh, we need to add more bandwidth. Oh, we need to add more, you know, storage space, whatever, right? So you've got to monitor your services for capacity issues so you can be ahead of the need to grow services, right? That's category two. Category three is, is basically service, um, what I would say is service relevance or service relevancy, depending on which English school you went to. But um, that's basically like, what what is the services impact, right, to the institution, Um and, and basically what, what I mean by that is like how important is that services existence to people doing their jobs, right, for the institution? How important is it for faculty? How important is it for administrators? You know, for how important is it for the enrollment management group versus some other group, right? So gauging sort of service relevance. And by the way, one quantitative way to do that is just to look at a services subscription rate, right? When it's not a, a pre-provisioned, everybody has this kind of service, but if it's a service where people opt into it, that's a really quantitative way to sort of gauge service relevance, right? If, if anyone can ask for it, but only 3% of your campus are using it, then maybe the service relevance isn't as high as we'd like it to be, right? Um, and then the final category, the fourth category is, is um, and again, people touch on the service satisfaction, right? Like how happy are people with the service, right? The service as it is delivered, you know, how how we as, a, as an IT organization deliver that service, like what is what are, what are our customers and users? And those aren't necessarily the same thing, by the way. What what is their level of satisfaction with with our services? Right? Where do we need to make improvements? If there is a fifth category, I mentioned accounts. It's cost, right? Like understanding the cost of providing service and, and offsetting that with you know the revenue or the value that it brings to the institution, right? So there's there's that metric too. But um, but I generally consider that sort of a peripheral metric. It's those other four that really matter. So that that's at a high level, sort of how. And I think at all levels of the organization, with all audience, depending on what altitude you know you're, you're flying, the metrics are still in those categories, right? To, to I think Alicia's point, as you you know get higher up the food chain, you're you're dealing more with trends and and big picture visualizations and stuff and percentages versus more of the minute details that like a service manager and operational lead might care about. But I think in general, those those four or five metrics categories are the are the kinds of metrics that we use without going into specific examples. So there you go. Hopefully short and sweet, or at least short. <laughs> well, we're here to talk, Mark, so I think you're doing great. Um, uh, unfortunately, I don't think we got to Todd Jensen's question before he had to jet, oh. um, which was, it looked like in the chat, um, what success we've had with implement, uh, oh, and now I've lost it. Here it is. Have you found your success implementing and utilizing metrics, especially org-wide, is driven by senior leadership, VPs, CIOs, provosts, deans, et cetera? I would say actually what we found at Cornell that a lot of it is very grassroots. Leadership tends to not know what exactly they wanna measure and I think part of it is just the continued work that the service management team needs to do with leadership to connect a strategy to the critical success factors to translate those to KPIs so that we can get the data to measure towards strategy. And that's a really hard thing to do because at least still at Cornell, the service management 
area isn't really looked at as that strategic partner that we need to be in order to help measure to strategy, you really have to reposition those key resources that are helping um, set up practices. Because if your tools don't measure it, just as people are just doing their daily jobs, it's really not going to create a bunch of, you know, uh, real time, accurate data that's getting collected with people just working to trickle up and to, to aggregate. I think we do a better job on the finance side because it's the real dollar. And I, I think that the trend in IT is we undervalue what we deliver to campus where we don't really articulate that the value IT is bringing strategically. You know, we'll say, oh, we ran a project. We, we launched a tool, done, hooray. But we don't translate that always to like how much administrative burden we might have reduced or how we've contributed to a better learning experience for students or that's those are harder to do without partnering with the functional side to find out well why do we implement this tool in the first place knowing that uh, I think would help us uh, we have had more success though with I think rolling up some proposals so last year we did a um, functional review with different members. I'm in the central IT organization and we did um, some workshops with unit IT groups where we pulled people from all over the university to really put our thinking caps on and our heads together to think about what should we all measure similarly together than in the same way so that we could start rolling up those um, high value metrics to senior leadership. And that's just hard because when you get into the practice of how people work, people are really attached to how they do things and their procedures and what tools they prefer to use. Not everybody's all in on service management. Not everybody's all in on the service management tool. So without that sort of strategic, I think, um, directive from leadership, it's going to make it very hard for you to, to work on metrics if you don't have at minimum just senior leadership saying, yes, we care about metrics. Yes, you need to use this tool. And it's because in order for us to have the information that we need, we've got to have the full picture of volume, which, we, we need, which means we need all of the work happening in this space so it can be measured. I don't think that they need to really get into the specifics, nor should they. But I think at minimum, your metrics effort could jump ahead with just some leadership, just stating that you care about data and, and kind of backing up the standard practices that you've your process folks have worked really hard to implement. Andrea or Mark, do either of you want to, this is Todd Jensen's question in the chat. Yeah, I can, I can answer that. Um, mine will be kind of short. I have not been asked for metrics by leadership for the most part. There's one exception that was kind of recent. Um, you know, and my mantra is always, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. <laughs> and so I, I've just sort of been doing it on my own, like figuring out, like there's questions I need answered to get my job done. And then I start looking at value add. So it's kind of been from the bottom up. Um, I think it's starting to take hold though in my organization as we've been making improvements to you know, other areas, they're starting to realize, hey, this is important. Um, we, so when I said there was that caveat, in January of 2023, our, uh, we have an interim CISO, Chief Information Security Officer. He has started to ask um, for, for standard metrics and pretty standard, simple things, and which I'm glad to see. I think this is really important. So I think he's making decisions based on some of these metrics, you know, where he wants to put his efforts as the CISO, what, what needs to be uh, addressed. And so I've been, that was a breath of fresh air. From time to time, someone will ask us for metrics, you know, can you tell us how many students had Wi-Fi issues last fall, you know, for some project they're working on. And we found um, that pulling reports sometimes is easy. Like I can do a keyword search and get a pretty good sense of how many students had Wi-Fi issues. Um, but if it's not been designed to, to pull that report, sometimes it's hit or miss. Sometimes it's a lot, a lot of manual, you know, deleting this and deleting that because it doesn't hit the mark. So that's kind of been how it's, you know, been for me. And again, we're, we're not as a mature ITSM organization. So I think that's kind of where our experience lies and that's why, but we're trying to get there. What about you, Mark? 
Yeah, I mean, in, in, it's funny because we had these sort of three canned questions just in case. And in, in a way, this sort of goes to, like, I, honestly, both of the other two, uh, you know, about audience and, and you know, sort of, sort of how do you get started? And, and the bottom line is, for me anyway, it, it's, this, this is all about conversations. And I think somebody said it actually in the chat. I think um, a- Andy Clark maybe said it that, that you know, um, that, uh, you know, basically this might actually spark interest in, like if you start to have conversations about the value of metrics, I think so often people do misconstrue metrics as these low level, uninteresting measurements. I, somebody even said in the chat, you know, nobody really cares about how many major instincts you have. First of all, I think your CIO might care about how many major instincts you have, but beside that, um, you know, the bottom line is people are bored by metrics unless you are able to translate them into a story and hopefully a successful story, right? So it, it always has to be around conversations and around feedback loops and around, you know, starting sort of at the most strategic level of the, uh, the strategic plane, if you will, and, and asking folks, like, what, what does success look like for you? You know, depending on where they are in the organization, if you're talking to the president or the VPs or the CIO, you might be asking, what does success look like to the institution, right? But as you work your way sort of down the food chain, you might be asking, what does success look like to you? You, uh, you a service owner, you a service manager, or whatever, right? So, so I think that's an important question. And then the follow-up to that question is, what are you trying to accomplish to ensure that success? Like, they've had to whittle on their own head. What does success look like? So now it's like, what, what, what specific things do you try to accomplish to ensure that success, right? And then diving further, it's like, okay, well, then how do you measure how well you're accomplishing that thing or those things, right? Like, and then they start to think, oh yeah, good point. Like, yeah, how do I, like, what is, what are my KPIs to Alicia's point, right? How do I, nobody thinks in KPIs, by the way, but they do think and like, yeah, how am I going to know whether or not I was. Yeah. They don't, they don't start with the KPI. They start with the metric of just like the volume and the raw data. But then what I see happens is they get bored because that doesn't change very much. Right. So I think you're on a journey a lot of times when you implement any kind of new measurement where st- you have to start maybe at a more rudimentary measure of volume and 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 the metric, as Mark is saying. And then once people kind of see, oh, the volume's the same every month, like by a couple hundred, it doesn't really change much. That's not really telling me anything. Uh, but then you say, okay, well, how responsive are we with that volume? Or how are we resolving that volume? Or are we accumulating a backlog of the volume? Suddenly it's, you're, you're, that's the maturity of your organization is kind of where they're looking. Uh, and if they first just start with, well, show me the volume or that, that raw base metric, go there with them. I think you have to build the understanding and the trust in your data, which is another really great question that someone put in the chat that I think Bob's going to have us answer um, after the canned questions. But as you get on that maturity journey, you really do have to build, how are we measuring this? Is it accurate? Are we confident? What does this mean? You know, before you can flip it into maybe a trend or a percentage or a KPI. So yeah, and I think you know, I think all too often it's it is so funny because Alicia brings up a really good point that people often start their metrics journey or whatever um, by just like looking at, at the the breadth and depth of data they have and it's like well this is easy to gather and collect this is easy to gather and collect and and yeah there are some by the way data scientists and data data analysts that might say that is the right approach right just get as much freaking data as you can and over time it'll put it in the lake it and just chat GP, you know put, yeah chat GP, it'll, it'll <laughs> put tell you. over it yeah. but or tableau but um but honestly you should start at what what again what's the story what are the questions you're trying to answer what is the what what are the you know what are the successes you're trying to create and what are the things that lead to those successes and and the funny thing is is i've been talking to different people about this and they're like oh, okay so they, they they say oh so work your way backwards which is so funny right because no, that's actually working your way forward. <laughs> because so few of us do it, it feels backwards, right? But no, that's where you're supposed to start, right? You're supposed to start at what story am I trying to tell? What data do I need to tell that story? Not what data do I have and what story can I tell with this data? That is not a strategic approach to metrics, right? So yeah. it's just consistent. Which I think that rolls in nicely, Mark, to our ne- the next question that we have on the docket is, how did you get started? Um, is the next question. So I'll just share uh, briefly, you know, I am a practice first type of individual where before we pull any data, before we start debating what metrics 
we should ask, let's find out who's responsible in our organization for delivering metrics. Let's outline, you know, who the stakeholders are, uh, what data we're interested in, and then let's talk about what tools do we need to support getting the data, publishing the data, delivering it. I want all that structure and mechanics before people get really impassioned about what user interface they want it to look like or what whether they like a chart or um, a bar graph like before we get into the specifics which I find in IT especially everybody wants to jump to the thing they don't want to wait and figure out the documentation of like a the roles and responsibilities they want to jump right to the artifact and then move on I think this is an area where you really do need to go slow um, because because you're going to use your metrics to make decisions you really need to be confident that they're accurate and that you're delivering them in appropriate fashion and that you've got the right things at the right levels. So it's not something to leap past the administration of actually documenting that and getting agreement. One resource that I would really encourage um, anybody who has that was in that in the survey was either hasn't gotten started or where you have pockets of excellence, I would encourage both of those scenarios to come back to the drawing board and really outline your your actual practice with your RACI. Because if you've got pockets of excellence, then what you might have is rock stars in your organization in, in certain areas that have maybe like full steam ahead. But if they're not taking the whole organization forward in, in maturity around metrics, then they're they're doing it for their area that they care about. That's great. But let's let's get that for everybody consistently as a quality measure across all the groups that need to to manage stuff so I, i'll refer you to a book that's only like three or four bucks on ebay and hashtag no sponsor uh but measuring itil if you haven't started or you have pockets of excellence but don't have a practice there's examples in here but i really wanted to draw your attention to chapter 19 is implementing an itsm metric metrics program and this particular chapter it will give you an idea of, in more than I could summarize for you in a in this short panel, what I mean by really treating this as a full blown practice and program that you're going to need for your organization for years. So um, set up that structure, figure out who your stakeholders are, get those roles and responsibilities, periodic activities that need to happen, weekly, monthly, quarterly, get all that outlined then I think you're ready to take the, the next step to actually meet, meet with focus groups and start conversations about what me metrics they need at each level of the organization or in order to do operations or think strategically. All right, and with that, I will pass it over to Andrea. The question is, how did you get started? Well, I got started, first of all, when I started working at Morgan State, it was based on my experience at another school where we're a little bit more mature. You know, I realized I needed to understand the service desk environment, you know, and, and what I was dealing with. Um, for example, you know, I felt like we were dying in printer costs. So what was our printing behavior in our computer labs? You know, I couldn't get my hands around it until I started, you know, basically looking at the stats. Um, and it was important for us to record our tickets um, in our ticketing tool at the time um, when I first started. Because I, I could tell as an organization, we needed more staffing. Like we were drowning in, in um, firefighting and there was just a lot of things that were, were happening that I thought I need to really track these tickets more than I normally would because I wanted to help other directors make a business case about their staffing levels. You know, as a division, as anyone knows, talking to a CFO, you gotta have numbers and you gotta show, you know, why you need more people and to show how many tickets went unanswered, went un resolved and from different teams that really helped make those comments and it's worked i mean it's taken years but it's worked so um and also just to kind of sideline i know we'll talk about this a little bit more but to greg's question in the chat about validating metrics i mean i i also when i got started said well we've got ticket production but what does our acd or automatic call distribution system say about how many calls are coming in and are my technicians writing tickets you know based on that or are they just, you know, answering a question, hanging up? Because I also need to know that for the phone staff. You know, do we have enough people on the phone? Because we all know first call resolution is important. You know, to get people on their way, we can really be efficient if if the front line could solve these problems. 
And so, you know, stuff like our remote support portal, um, it's we're using a tool called Beyond Trust. That's something I wanted to monitor because number one, I wanted to justify the expense because I knew <laughs> from working at an institution that had a tool similar, we could solve so many more issues on the phone if we could just remote control into someone's computer, get it fixed, and then end the call. So those were things that I wanted to, you know, start um, doing right off the bat. That's kind of how I got started. Um, simple things like how many people are using SPSS because in, in our environment, the faculty and staff um, have an installation that renews every year when we, we renew our license. So not only am I checking, is it still valid to renew this? Do we have the numbers to justify it? I also can reach out to those folks and say, hey, your license renewal is coming up in a month. You know, let's get ready. Um, do you still want it? You know, that type of thing. And also at the time I would track projects because um, other people <laughs> weren't. And it's because they were just doing it, doing it. And I'm like, okay, whoa, like we were going from Windows 8 to Windows 10, you know, where are we at with this? And we've got deadlines. And, you know, most recently we were tracking our 21H2 upgrade project um, for Windows 10, you know, to see where are we at. And now I'm starting to look at Windows 11. You know, who's got Windows 11 on campus because I want to get out in front of it early because um, I'm sure next year in 20, um, actually probably this fall, we'll start the push to Windows 11. So those are just some of the things that, you know, that I was thinking of to get started and, and I needed data in order to determine what path we were on and was it the right path. Mark, what about you? Yeah, those are great, Andrea, by the way. Um, I mean, I really like the fact that you you were looking at the breadth of like that's the problem is there's not just one data source for some of these metrics right like there's lots of data sources so totally. to Andrew's point like not just looking at you know the number of tickets or or whatever but also the the ACD data or you know and you could even extend that to looking at your you know your the uh the the knowledge knowledge base accesses right and how many sort of self-service things not just first call resolution, but but like, you know, tier zero, right? The customer just helping themselves, right? So I think, and so you have to look at all those things together to understand sort of the, the resolution metric, if you will, right? So I think that's a really important point. I mean, I think I kind of already addressed the, but how do we get started? Lots of conversations, lots of feedback loops. I mean, we step back a little bit or, or not step back, but we, we made sure before we got really serious about metrics, we understood responsibility. We understood individual roles and people's responsibilities. Uh, I think Alicia alluded to, you know, the racy. Hopefully, by the way, hopefully we're throwing acronyms at you that you've all heard. But if not, feel free. To roles and responsibilities. It's uh, it's racy, just basically who's responsible, responsible for what. <laughs> Figure it out. <laughs> yeah. Consulted that that racy, but um, you know, you have to kind of look at the individual roles again. So you know, in a in a in a in a you know or. or organized service management paradigm, right? You've got explicit roles with responsibilities. You've got service owners that are responsible for sort of service strategy, right? They care about service relevance and service satisfaction. Whatever. You've got service managers who are more or less the operational leads, right? As I think ITIL actually calls them service level managers, but either way, the point is, is that you, you have folks that are more responsible and more interested in the day-to-day -day metrics, right? In terms of service delivery and service resolution. So, I, again, and then you've got, you know, the executive suite, right? And they care about, like, again, big picture. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, how successful overall we, we are being or not. And so I, I think you have to start with roles. And you have to start basically, see, here's the hard part is most IT people are introverts, not all, but most are introverts. You got to be an extrovert when it comes to, you, you got to go have conversations. You are not going to be able to tell stories and gather the right, the right metrics and performance indicators and, and on up the chain if you if you don't go out and talk to people in, in the roles that I mentioned. So that's the thing is you got to kind of get out of your shell, um, if I can use a, a terrapin metaphor from days gone by, and and really like engage your audiences and understand, you know, what what different stories those different levels in the organization, you know, need to tell. As an example, when I asked my CIO what was really important to him, and hopefully he he won't hate me for revealing this, he was really concerned about you know, we have a lot of, you know, executives, right? A lot of VPs, we have a cabinet, right? Like every institution. He was really concerned that he, that he would be asked in a meeting or whatever about an incident and he wouldn't have awareness of it, right? By a VIP. So 
one of the things he wanted to see on a dashboard, you know, one of the metrics he wanted to, to know was sort of how many incidents are we receiving and resolving from VIPs explicitly, which means we had to have a category to identify what defines a VIP. And by the way, it's not VIP in a, you know, title sense. It's VIP like in terms of when these people are having issues, the impact of the institution is huge, right? If the president can't go speak to a big fundraising drive or whatever, that's a really big impact, right? So it's not so much that he's the president or whatever. It's it's the impact of the institution, but mm -hmm. that's what categorizes or qualifies one to be sort of on the VIP list. But my CIO really wanted to have a dashboard that showed him actively like what's going on today with VIP. So when he, when he was at a cabinet meeting or whatever, he was in the know, right? So, and again, I wouldn't have known that without just asking, well, what's, in, what's important to you? That was important to him. So you really have to have those conversations with you know, with, again, sort of up and down the, the, the food chain of your organization. That, that's, to me, that's how you get started is by having lots of conversation. Mm -hmm. Which you need to, a lot of time for, right? I think time. people underestimate, I think that point you're making, Mark, is how much time and effort with people you need to plan for. Yeah. Um, the, the, honestly, the tool parts are almost the easy part, right. <laughs> you know, getting the data. But getting consensus and getting people to use your metrics and KPIs, like a lot more work to be done there. So all the more reason to point back to having somebody with the role and responsibility of shadowing that and shepherding through that's really dedicated to it, your success with that. Um, not, not that the data isn't super important and the data accuracy mm -hmm. is super important and all that kind of stuff, but hopefully you, yeah, and identifying well, where, where are the authoritative sources of data, that's all important, but hopefully you have data people to do that, right? Like that's the, mm -hmm. the idea is if your role is more in the service management paradigm in general, hopefully you're relying on others to validate data accuracy and to identify authoritative sources of data and all, and all and to, uh, and to identify all the sources again, because again, you're going to probably have multiple data sources for any one metric or anyone question you're you're trying to answer any story you're trying to tell so you, you do have to rely on the sort of that that data layer and i mean that the organizational sense to 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 gather all that competently but uh yeah so to, so so i guess you're we're answering greg's question in the chat how do your metrics factor in uh how good the data is um i i'm kind of proud actually of what we've done at cornell uh in that before we started rolling any data or metrics up out of the new um, service management suite, we'd been running it for a year or so, and we had confidence confidence measures on our data. So because we would we would have a sample of tickets that were sent every month to a member of my team to go through and check the data for accuracy on tickets because we were also implementing standard practices. So did they classify it against the right services? Did they use process correctly? Uh, did they misuse any of the on hold statuses? Did they forget to assign the ticket to themselves? All these things that, as the org was learning that I have to do these things. We had quarterly refresher training to send anybody back through the training if they were showing up consistently uh, as uh, not accurately working um, tickets. And so I do think that you have to be confident in your data when you audit that sample, then you can actually say, um, like we had a 5% acceptable sort of error rate because things sometimes just happen and it falls into the realm of, I, I need to be able to not care about every little glitch unfortunately that could exist in my, in the tool but as long as it falls below that sort of five percent threshold then I'm fairly still confident giving those rolled up KPIs and percentages to leadership and if they use them to make a decision I would not be like concerned that they, that the data would be misinforming them but I think you have to really set the tone that that's important because you also want your metrics and reporting practice to be the authoritative source for metrics and data because once they're un once your org understands that you have that kind of quality with the what you're outputting for them ideally then they're not going to self source data from anywhere and treat it with the same level of um uh, uh, assumption that it's gone under that scrutiny to make sure it's accurate so that is really important yeah, I love the fact that Greg just asked about automation. You know, um, depending on where you are in your journey and, and where you are in terms of like, you know, are you sort of, you know, 
hooking your train to ITIL 3 or ITIL 4 or whatever, um, and, and do you even care or know the difference? I, I, I would just say that one thing that ITIL 4 calls out specifically that ITIL 3 never makes real mention of is automation, right? And the, the, uh, the importance of automation, not only in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, but also in terms of accuracy. And I think if you read some of the literature on ITIL 4, you'll see just how critical automation is not to, to everything, but uh, certainly in, in data gathering and data validation and such. Um, so that's a really good, uh, real, really good call out there. Yeah, and just to answer that for what we're doing at Morgan State, I wish, I mean, we don't have a solution yet to do something like this. We've been talking about it as a leadership team, but yeah, unfortunately we don't have it automated. I mean, other than reports, you know, coming to us automated, but that's not what you're talking right about. The system. Yeah, I mean, and of course there were, you know, all sorts of data exchange engines and things like the data exchange languages for that matter and write and obviously APIs and things like that. I mean, there are things like, uh, you know, like I know Team Dynamics, has a tool that, by the way, can be mutually exclusive from Team Dynamics. It's called IPASS, but it stands for Integration Platform as a Service. And it literally is an integrator, sort of a codeless integrator platform that lets you do things like data exchange or, you know, trigger, uh, you know, trigger events and things like that. Anything you can do sort of through an API, but this thing kind of makes the sort of the mechanics of having to interface with an API or between APIs of two systems makes it a lot easier. So. And, and then again, back to the data accuracy thing in general, obviously the more eyes you have on something, the better, right? So we tend to, you know, develop what a, what, what data elements we need to, again, to, to um, paint an accurate picture of a metric or tell a story or answer a question. And then we have sort of a, a validating set of eyes that goes behind the scenes and looks and make sure that the, the data is being extracted from the right sources in the right way that, you know, we try to we try to make sure again we identify authoritative sources of data right if you're doing you know whatever if you're you've got centralized endpoint management as a for instance then hopefully you're relying on things like microsoft endpoint manager or, or jamf if you're on the mac environment or whatever to kind of be the authoritative source of endpoint data right like that's that's as opposed to stuff that you kind of get off of tickets which to alicia's point you know may or may not be a, you know without its glitches so you want to try to rely on the you know, discovery protocols and things like that that can be sort of the authoritative source for such data. I think that's important. Great. Yeah, so with five minutes on the clock, but I can definitely stay a little bit longer. But for the sake of time, let's try to get to the last uh, question. Uh, how did you choose your audience is the question. Um, ours, we really in include everyone in our audience. And what I mean by that is, when we structure the service management framework that gets implemented, um, we most technicians and service delivery managers are within the ticketing system. Most senior leadership are looking more at budget and cost data and the service portfolio, which is a custom product we have. Um, so we have a data repository where we just pull everything in once we kind of knew what types of data people were going to commonly need, we put that in a data repository. And so then we can have dashboards by audience. The, the, the audience is looking at metrics that need to know what should I take today or this week or what do I need to influence this month. Most of those are desktops within the service management suite that the managers have as recommended manager reports and desktops to technicians. So those audiences tend to use um, those reports and senior leadership and hire that that's where we're um, using Tableau so that we can pull ticket data right next to budget and cost data right next to uh, portfolio data on the same dashboard so that we can pull in those um, aggregate uh, benefits from multiple sources. Andrea? Yeah, I think in in our environment, you know, my audience really at this point is myself and the questions I'm trying to answer, um, you know, anything I'm trying to build a business case around, or sometimes people come to me and say, hey, I'm trying to do this. Can you help me think this through? So I might help them with the stats that I know about, um, you know, so that we can manage something and, and, and make some decisions around it. So I typically share my reports with my supervisor and, and the other leadership teams. Anyone who asks me, I just share it with them especially now that our CISO is on board, he's been really interested in metrics. So I certainly uh, put those inside his report so that he's got them. So yeah, it, it's kind of one of those things where I'm hoping one of these days it'll take off and, and then we're all gonna be on the same page. But until then, I'm just gonna plug away. 
What about you, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I'd say, yeah, you know, again, the third guy is going to sound repetitive, but uh, yeah, I mean, everything that these guys said, but also, I, I mean, again, I, I can't emphasize enough sort of, you know, how do you choose your audience? I mean, diversity is key. It's not just a buzzword, right? It, it, it's real. Like you got to, you got to sort of approach it from all the different levels of the organization because the, the things that an operational lead, um, you know, um, care, care cares about, right? That that audience, right, of all of your different operational, all of your service managers, all your operational leads across all of your services, that's a very different audience than, say, the, the C-suite, which is a very different audience than, say, you know, the strategic um, owners of services, right? Like the service owners who actually sort of own service categories. They're responsible for strategy over time, right? Like when do we decommission, you know, telephony? Because let's face it, everybody uses Teams and Zoom, right? Like those kinds of questions, right? So I, you, you have to look at, at uh, you know, at, I mean, it's for me, it's how do you choose your audience? Yeah, you, we didn't choose an audience. We, we tried to embrace all audiences. So again, back to Alicia's point, lots of time, lots of conversations, up and down sort of the people stack to try to understand what's going to help every level of the organization be successful and, and measure that success. So that's, that's my short answer. One minute. <laughs> wow. We're, we're like really being good with the time here. Yeah. Um, go with who is, is leaning into metrics while you have their attention. That's a great place to start. So I think even like Andrea was saying, go with, you know, who's working on it. And if you've structured it out in your practice for the whole organization, it's easier to kind of plug and play, fit them in uh, when you have their attention. And that kind of gains dividends too, is like you get some momentum with one group and then others will likely be at your door at some point wanting the same thing. All right, how are we doing on questions, Bob? We've got one minute. Did we answer everything in the chat that came in? One question we could maybe tackle a little bit, it was tackled in chat, but might be worth seeing if you guys have anything else to comment is from Benjamin around um, developing metrics as part of developing and releasing new services. So I don't mm -hmm. know if anybody has anything to add to that one. I I have a lot of thoughts about um, where I wish we could go with that in the future. I will not say that we're a very mature institution when it comes to these and um i think it has to do with we really had a a change in in all of our directors it was kind of funny that we all kind of there was a big swap out so a lot of things that had been measured in the past sort of fell off in importance and with that change in in leadership it, it changed sort of what they were looking at so I will say that it's firmly needs to be thought of during the service design. And part of what I'm trying to correct is work with our PMO organization so that service management gets included earlier when new things are coming on. Because part of my challenge right now is they connect service management too much with support because those are the most well-known processes that we've implemented that they they'll contact us like a month before they're going to go live and that's almost too late they're in the thick of it in their project they don't have time to really think about sustainable metrics long term for the service like I wish they they would so I think if you can position yourself early in the onboarding and transition then you've got a better chance of having those more strategic conversations around okay, here's a new service capability. What does success look like? We're offering this capability. Nothing lasts forever. We know in five, seven years, we'll be out here replacing it. Like, what are some things that we can measure that allow us to know, is the service being used? How many users? Is it healthy? Is it delivering the value we initially set it up to do? That thought activity, um, you need somebody's brain when they're not stressed out. So if you put service design too close to launch, you're not going to have the creative energy from the folks that you need to really get those those measurements. That would be my two, two cents on that. Andrea or Mark, anything to add? No, I would concur. I think, I mean, again, not sound repetitive, but, you know, back to the, you know, capacity, performance, relevance, satisfaction, like all those categories and, and, and do them early. I mean, I think, I, I just posted a link to a service trend because this question is really around service transition, right? Like how do we launch a project, which right, is almost always 
starts it, the genesis of most services is a project right so how do how, how we launch a service is we create a project to develop the service right and then we have some period of transition where we're preparing to go live with the service and and delivering that service right and so I, I stuck a, a URL here to a resource that hopefully you, you might find useful, which is basically a transition methodology and, and a toolkit. And, and among uh, uh, the tools in that toolkit are, are things like a, a, a service transition checklist, right? To make sure we've identified the, the success factors and the data that will um, help us understand if we've met those success factors. As well as we've done the training of the service, as well as all the other things you have to do, right? We've set up KB articles. We've, you know, we've had communication with customers about, you know, we've done all the things that you need to wrap around a service before you put that service in production. So I think mm -hmm. metrics is certainly one one critical element of that. But um, but there's lots of critical elements to launching a new service or even a, a significant service change. Not even necessarily about a new service. It's a you've added some pretty, um, you know, amazing feature to a service, or you've changed the way a service behaves in some significant way, all those things warrant probably a project and some some form of deliberate transition management. Um, so hopefully that toolkit might be helpful. Yeah, this, I had not seen this before. This is a great checklist mark. It looks, we have a checklist internal, we'll have a main release ticket in Team Dynamics when we're onboarding a new service. And then those tasks, we have very similar checklists where we then assign out service requests all okay. over to different teams for different pieces of it. And it's really made the transition to support a lot smoother because just- Consistent, right? Yeah. It's consistency, yeah. And and I think that the more that catches on, I'm hoping that the service metrics can be one of those things. Um, we're not there yet, but Andrea, anything to add on the, no? No, nothing to add. But that is a great resource. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, this is great. And another question that Greg just asked, and I know we're over, so we understand that people have to bail, maybe most have, but uh, Greg asked about the, the eCar service catalog model, which I was one of the authors of, of the original um, catalog model. We, we've since had a, a revision. But um, I think, the, the, yeah, the main goal of that, by the way, um, was the kind of things we're talking about today. The main goal of having a standard higher ed service catalog that we all sort of use a similar vernacular to describe services was so that we could peer benchmark against each other. We could understand from each other, well, what does it cost for you guys to deliver that service that you're calling X because we're calling it, we're also calling it X or whatever. So I think that 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 was the intention of the of the service catalog model was to was to basically um, make sure that we're being as as consistent as we can be. Right, we're all we're all individual institutions with our with our little quirks and nuances, but in general, we can try to align to a model as close as possible. That will make it more likely that we can compare everything from service costs to, you guess it, all the other service metrics, right? So um, that was the that was the aspiration with the service catalog model, and I think I think it's helped. I, I know it helped us when when we were selecting a new tool. It helped us just understand um, different aspects of different people's service catalog structures and how they set up their service catalog. Because quite frankly, our service catalog and our previous platform was really, really just sort of abysmal and confusing. And we moved in moving to a new platform. We also moved to sort of a universal service catalog paradigm where we said as an institution, we're not going to make people figure out whether or not a service has gotten from IT or gotten from, you know, facilities or whomever. You just put in a ticket in the universal service catalog or request. You navigate to the category of service you're looking for. And behind the scenes, we figure out which provider you know, behind the scenes, whether that's central IT or whether it's classroom technology or facilities or whomever, right? It figures out behind the scenes sort of, you know, who who to dispatch those tasks to. And, and again, that all comes back and relates to service metrics because you have to make these metrics and the, and the you know, the, the trends in metrics sort of universally understandable, right? To the people across, not just IT, but now we're bringing in service providers who really aren't IT heads, right? They're they're in enrollment management or whatever. So you, you have to be able to build metrics that makes it, they don't necessarily think about life in terms of first call resolution, right? <laughs> they think about life and like retention and recruitment, right? So it's a totally different level of, of, of metrics and, and success factors. So um, it helps to kind of translate things into plain English. Well, one controversial point, maybe, and I don't, I, I love the eCar white paper. I love the catalog. I like the concept. I think it does a great job of explaining a customer service catalog, but I do not subscribe to using it for the service taxonomy. And this might be a tool difference, like, because I don't, I'm not a service now user, 
But we have a common data model for services that we use across all tools. And a catalog is really an output for customers. Not everything is in the catalog. That's right. Yeah. So really having that, that the service portfolio be the source of truth for services and driving your taxonomy agnostic of your other tools, um, I, feel, I find to be important because you're going to have many tools used for service management, not just a service now or not just a team dynamics. Right. And you're going to need to keep that master service taxonomy that portfolio. for always that portfolio. And so that really in and of itself needs to be, in my opinion, its own thing, um, because you're going to set up budgets according to the services and uh, having a primary ID number across every single tool used for service management so that you can map things when you pull it into a data repository will give you dividend it will give you dividends like it will just um make the data piece of metrics gathering so much easier so i as much as i love the car and the catalog that to me is um really just the yeah, services you're publishing perfect. yeah you, yeah I mean, and by the way the, the 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 idea behind that and by the way it does address portfolio more broadly than just catalog but the, so the headline might be a, a misnomer but but it it is the approach was kind of like the ITIL approach, right? It's it's mm -hmm. a, adopt and adapt, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of what you need. You, I don't think anybody has done all of ITIL. At least I've never met anyone on the planet Earth. It's like- Fully kind of, rolled out program, all the processes. All the processes. I wish. Yeah, yes. I really doubt that any, any, any civilization on the planet has like done all of ITIL. So it's it's meant to be, again, adopted and adapted sort of, you know, as 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 you are able and as, as things make sense for your institution, your organization, but, you know, it is a way without being overly prescriptive to give you some starting point. I always believe starting is the hardest part, right? Like once you get starting, right, momentum is just like its own thing. But like where to start is always challenging, no matter what it is in life we do. And I think frameworks like ITIL and, and some of these models like the, the ECAR higher ed catalog or the transition uh, article for that matter are just meant to be models to give you some form of a starting point, some some you know, solid understanding of the possibilities and potential. So you can kind of, you know, again, tune things for your institution and, and where you are on your maturity level and your data access and your data governance, all that. By the way, ITIL 4, like, totally, like, goes there. It goes to data governance and automation, right? Data, ITIL 4 calls things practices versus processes because it realized, hey, guess what? Processes kind of leave the people piece out. Probably not a good idea. So um, unless you're chat GPT, but so... Yeah, so definitely uh, ITIL 4 kind of recognizes, oh, people are like a critical part of service delivery, hence the reword sounds subtle, but the reword from processes to practices is actually very, very intentional on ITIL 4, just for that reason. Anyway. I hope, Greg, I answered your question in the chat, which was a Team Dynamics tool specific question, but for those that do have different tools where you're trying to align with ECAR, you will, if you're using Team Dynamics, find that it doesn't doesn't align very you have to do you have to use types but not to turn this into a tool conversation if anybody's curious how i configured team dynamics i'm happy to take um i will attempt to check my inbox the the edge cause where you can email people you can find me out there uh, alicia hilliard uh, and I, i'm happy to share the uh kb i have on how i configured team dynamics and like, likewise, by the way, I will say not to contradict, but but we also are a team dynamic shop now, as I mentioned, and we did fundamentally base our universal service catalog on the higher ed car model in, in team dynamics. I, I think it just depends on how you, again, how you digest and how and how you ultimately adapt and adopt, because um, uh, we certainly didn't uh, adopt it in whole, you know, but um, but certainly we tried to stick to the primary categories, service categories and stuff again sort of in the interest of, of again, primarily being able to peer benchmark. But but also, again, it was a genesis. It was a starting point um, just for us to be able to wrap our heads around. Mm -hmm. you know. And service, uh, their TDX service offerings weren't added till later. So we definitely, yeah, yeah, right. when we, we were launching, had to, yeah, do some. So it's a journey. Yeah, we, we were lucky in that we, when we launched Team Dynamics, they already had service requests built in so we didn't have to kind of un-engineer un and re-engineer that whole that whole paradigm um, mm -hmm. it was helpful all right any other questions and thanks for the 
19 participants still hanging on here. If you have any final questions with our three panelists, we're all we're here for you. If you've got a final question, otherwise. We'll and there'll be other panels with other other answers, yeah. and other perspectives and mm -hmm. other opportunities. So um, yeah, looking forward to it. I don't see anything else. Bob, are we in the clear? Yeah, I think it's good okay. to wrap it up. I'm sure hopefully we got people thinking and we'll see some questions um, maybe roll out onto the CG list itself or you know get a hold of any one of us and we'll make sure future panels consider that. There is an open poll about things for us to tackle in the future. So if you have ideas, make sure you put answer that poll question and we thank you. Thanks, folks. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Thank Coke. Everybody. Hi, everybody. Hey, guys. See ya.